Let's check it with me. We don't hear you, Osama. Welcome everyone to the webinar of today. We are just uh, waiting a couple of seconds to ensure that we have all our participants on board. So please bear with us. Only a few seconds, please. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining our webinar today. My name is Osama Al Nouri, and I'm a project manager at BirdLife International Middle East Division. And thanks for our donors that have been supporting us in this uh, project, mainly the MAVA Foundation and the Jeff UNDP, who are supporting two important uh, initiatives that are related to hunting. BirdLife International is an international NGO that aims support of people, nature, and birds, and is interested in the subject since uh, some real time with Im Im very important contributions. Uh, today, our, uh, our topic is the illegal methods of uh, hunting in the Mediterranean. Uh, the Mediterranean has been always a scene of hunting, a hunter after the quarry has been the scene since eternity in the Mediterranean, but this has been always taking place in uh, during the historical stages, uh, in dignity, dignity and honor, both to the hunter and to the quarry. Unfortunately, this has been uh, not the case uh, in the last uh, 100 years or so, and uh, a new awareness is now generated by uh, NGO pioneerings in the region and at the international level to ensure that we go back to our noble hunting practices. Speakers uh, with us today are Jessica Williams from BirdLife International, uh, Ra Mohamed Raouf, uh, NCE, BirdLife Partner in Egypt, and uh, SPNL Society for the Protection of Nature in Lebanon. We have three speakers uh, in the row that are uh, managing this uh, action, Basima Khatib, Lena Farran, and Adonis Al Khatib. So uh, the way forward will be that we will go with the presentations right away. We will not uh, have uh, questions and answers until after the three presentations are done. And then there will be an opportunity for all the uh, uh, attendees with us. And I'm very glad to say that we are having, in fact, and indeed, I can see uh, uh, many participants from all around the Mediterranean and beyond, which is a, a great sign. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining. 
Uh, without further ado, uh, I will uh, uh, give the floor to uh, our uh, our colleague. But be, before doing so, uh, I uh, remind people that uh, they can. There is a simultaneous translation taking place of the event. Uh, participants can choose either the English or the Arabic channel to uh, have the uh, interpretation. The speakers, all the speakers uh, are speaking in English, yet for Arabic speakers who would like to listen to the Arabic uh, interpretation, they can do so. And I am very glad to have our uh, dear colleague Atif Rabi, who is our uh, interpreter of the event of the day. Without further uh, delay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Jessica Williams, BirdLife International, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Osama. Um, thanks everyone for joining. Bear with me while I um, share my screen. Um, uh, it's a little slow to load. All right, so you should be you should be seeing my screen, okay? Okay. Um, so as Osama said, uh, my name is Jessica Williams. Um, I am a uh, the a conservation officer in BirdLife International, um, based in the UK, and I'm going to be speaking today uh, about uh, illegal hunting, trapping, and trade of wild birds in the Mediterranean. So um, what I'll do is I will give a brief introduction for those of you that are maybe not so familiar with this topic. Um, so I'll outline what, what it is exactly and uh, why it's a conservation priority for bird life and uh, what we are doing uh, throughout the entire Mediterranean region and beyond to tackle this issue. Um, uh, illegal hunting is a complex issue, um, but there are solutions. So I hope that my presentation will show this. Um, and my, my fellow, fellow panelists will go into much more detail on the, the challenges and the successes on the ground, as well as on the, the illegal methods themselves in their respective uh, countries. Um, and before I continue, I should uh, maybe preface this presentation with a, a little warning uh, to say that it does contain some gruesome imagery. So you can already see that some of the, some of the photographs are not going to be so pleasant, but I've tried to keep this to a minimum. So why do we work on illegal hunting and trapping? Well, uh, this, um, this threat is actually one of the most significant threats to, to migratory birds. It's, it's the second biggest threat that migratory birds face globally. Um, a recent um, scientific paper by, by BirdLife showed that 26% of all extinctions uh, since the 1500s have been caused by hunting and trapping. Um, so this is a significant conservation priority. This is not something that we're working on for um, ethical or, or moral reasons or a standpoint against hunting. This is, is driven by conservation uh, priority. So I wanted to start out this presentation um, by giving two um, cautionary tales, let's say. Uh, so two, two species that were hunted to extinction in the not so distant past. Um, and both of these species provide us with lessons that, that can guide our conservation work. Voice, voice and clear and equal as well. Thank you. Oh, um, hang on. Uh, is everyone muted on the call? Is the echo coming from somewhere else or on my side? If I continue, is that, is that better? Yes, now it's better. Thank you, Jessica. Okay. I'll, I'll go a little bit closer to the screen so that you can pick up my voice a little bit better. Apologies about that. Um, so, so uh, talking about these cautionary tales, so these two species which um, were hunted to extinction in, in the past. Uh, one is the great auk. Um, you might not be so familiar with this species. It uh, was a flightless bird found in the North Atlantic and this bird um, was hunted for its feathers, for its down, uh, in order to uh, make pillows and, and bedding. And what's really chilling about this story, oh, I'm getting an echo again. 
Is that okay? Is there still an echo? Sorry about this, everyone. Okay, Sorry, there was an issue. Uh, it was fine. Thank you. Um, apologies about that. Um, so yes, the 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 Great Orc. Um, it was one of the first times that uh, humans realized um, their role in in the extinction of of a species. So. Humans, while they were hunting the species, were aware, in fact, that it was going extinct and um, brought in legislation, so uh, legal protections to try and halt um, the extinction of the species. The first legal protection for the species um, came in as early as 1553. Um, and there was a many subsequent legal protections in, in the different regions of the world that it um, was present. Um, and yet this did not stop its demise. Um, and the second cautionary tale is the passenger pigeon. So many of you will be familiar with this species. Um, once um, the most abundant species um, globally, perhaps, individuals numbered in, in their billions and flocks of this bird were said to black in the sky. There were so many of them. Um, they were kilometers wide. And um, the species was also unfortunately hunted to extinction. So in um, a matter of um, a couple of decades, they went from billions to, to extinct, and the last one expired in 1914. Um, so the tale here is that uh, abundance of the species is, is not enough to, to protect it from, from extinction. Uh, extinction is, is still a risk, even when we're talking about abundant species. So then I wanted to, to flip to, to modern um, present day species that are uh, at risk of extinction due to hunting. So we have the yellow-breasted bunting. Uh, this is a uh, once common abundant species in uh, the Eurasian continent um, and went from being least concern in 2005. So population um, was, was stable um, it was not endangered in any way in 2005. And then due to widespread, right, widespread and unchecked hunting, this uh, species um, was listed as critically endangered in, in 2017. So a massive decline in just a number of years. Um, and the second species uh, that is, is present and, and currently endangered and is a little bit closer to home, so it's present in, in the Mediterranean, is a sociable lapwing. Um, this species also was quite abundant, it's a very gregarious um, species of wader, um, and its population has declined significantly. Uh, and we've, we've recently discovered uh, a paper published recently um, that the main threat to the species survival is in fact hunting. So what do we know about uh, illegal hunting? Well, in uh, 2015, uh, BirdLife International published the first comprehensive scientific paper uh, on the scope and scale of legal killing in the Mediterranean. This, as Osama said, had been long recognized as, as, a, as a threat in this region um, and, and BirdLife sought to, to find out more and to quantify the scale of this threat. So in 2015, uh, we, we exposed the, the magnitude of the illegal killing in the Mediterranean 25 million birds are estimated to be killed every year in this region. And we can see from the, the map here on the screen um, where the worst locations are. So we can really see that in, in Italy, for example, 5.6 million birds are being illegally killed each year. In Egypt, 5.7 million. In Lebanon, 2.6 million. So these this is on, on a huge scale. This is a very significant concern. Um, and wherever we looked, we, we found legal killing to be widespread. So in 2017, we looked at Northern Europe and the Caucasus. In 2019, we looked at the Arabian Peninsula, um, Iraq and Iran. We found that 3.2 million birds are being illegally killed each year. And we've got new studies in the pipeline in Asia and in sub-Saharan Africa, which we hope will shed light on the situation there. 
And um, our research looked not only at the scale of, of the illegal hunting, um, um, but also identifying worst locations, uh, what types of species were being targeted, and what types of crimes were being perpetrated. So I'm not sure if you can make out on the graphs here, um, but the types or the, the the types of crime vary. So it could be illegal shooting, um, illegal illegal trapping. We also have uh, poisoning and persecution, um, hunting of protected species or in protected areas. So there's a wide variety of of, of crimes taking place. Um, we also, these, these papers, this, our research, uh, looked into what the motivations behind the illegal hunting was. Um, and we found that there's a very diverse range of, of reasons. So there's the drivers, the reasons behind uh, this illegal hunting are, are diverse, and they're also very culturally specific. So the top three uh, motivations or reasons for undertaking illegal killing or illegal hunting um, were found to be food, uh, recreation, or trapping for the cage bird and pet trade. But even within these uh, top three, um, there's still a, a wide range of, of differences. So, Whereas in uh, Malta, for example, um, trapping is a very traditional and recreational pastime. Um, in Cyprus, um, birds are caught and sold and consumed as, as a delicacy. Uh, whereas in other parts of the world, um, Lebanon, for example, caged birds such as goldfinch are, are extremely popular. So there's very regional and local specificities uh, driving this illegal hunting. And it's often bound up very much in, in tradition and in cultural identity. Um, so it's a very complex situation. Um, we, we noted from this research in the, to the Mediterranean that although food is the, the biggest cited driver for illegal hunting, this masks actually what, what's happening. So in the Mediterranean, uh, people are not hunting for subsistence food. So this is not to supplement um, protein. Hunting for food rather is, is often as a culinary delicacy. So um, uh, birds are killed and, and sold in restaurants or eaten at uh, traditional holidays um, and um, also killed for sport and then subsequently uh, consumed. So this, um, this uh, threat of illegal hunting is, is um, not, not just um, cultural and it's not just uh, traditional, it's also big business, especially in the Mediterranean. Um, so as Osama mentioned in the introduction, um, hunting and trapping has, has always been done um, since time immemorial. Um, but recent years and uh, advances in technology have meant that this hunting and trapping is being done on an industrial scale. Um, and it's often uh, organized or controlled uh, by crime groups. So organized crime is often involved in the, the trapping and the hunting and the subsequent trade of, of these wild birds. Um, in Cyprus, the government estimates that the black market trade in birds is worth 50 million euros each year. Um, and this is estimated to be uh, m worth more than, than the drugs trade. So this is, this is big business. This is not, um, not only traditional and, and, and recreational hunting. This is um, an industry. And it's often um, reports from our partners in, in the Balkans have shown that this industry is often not profiting the locals. So uh, these organized crime cartels are, are, are profiting massively from the destruction of, of, um, of biodiversity of these species. So what can we do to tackle this? We've seen that, um, that this is a conservation priority, that hunting and, and um, 
trapping leads to extinctions. Um, we've seen that this is culturally important, uh, but also massively profitable. Um, so what can we do to, to end this? And our approach uh, has to, because of the diversity of the, of the situation of hunting in each local area, our approach has to be adapted to the local context. Um, this is not one single phenomenon. It's not a homogenous issue, um, but actually is, is many um, distinct uh, situations playing out and resulting in, in illegal killing of birds. Um, this also means that because of the complexity, um, simply defining something as illegal, so ensuring that adequate environmental protections are in place and legislation and hunting regulations are in place, this does not solve the problem by itself. And this, this is the biggest challenge. So because of this, we have a multifaceted approach. Um, the first and most important, of course, is to ensure that the legislation is in place. So ensuring that um, legislation is adequate and that it's informed by, by the science um, uh, and that it's being if enforced effectively by the authorities who are responsible for this. Um, but that's just the first step. After that, uh, we must work with local populations, local communities, uh, hunting groups, um, uh, raising awareness of this issue, um, offering training and, and support to, to hunters to ensure that they uh, are identifying species correctly, that they're aware of the legislation, they're aware of the, the impact of the hunting methods that they're using. And we also need to train law enforcement officials to ensure that they are aware of the significance of this threat and of the legislation surrounding different hunting methods. And in addition to this, we also need to work on sustainable livelihoods. So this, this is um, industries that can replace um, the, the profit that was being um, uh, built by, by hunting and illegal hunting. And finally, um, we also work on rehabilitation centers and release programs. So uh, we, we care for and we, um, we, we uh, release the birds that have been injured through, wild, uh, through illegal hunting. So this is, on the, this is on the ground actions, but we also need to tackle this internationally. Um, this is especially a problem when it comes to hunting of migratory species. So what happens in one country um, affects the populations of birds in, in another country. Um, so working, working alone will not solve the problem. Um, so this is where BirdLife International is, is uniquely placed to tackle this issue. Um, and our work uh, takes place on different levels. So with, the, with our partnership, our BirdLife partners on the ground, we ensure that our conservation actions are joined up. So we're linking work that's happening in uh, Egypt, in Lebanon, in Syria, all up the flyway to make sure that our conservation actions are connected. We are also working at the national level. So working with governments, with uh, national and local authorities um, to ensure that there is political will to tackle this issue. And then one step above that, we're also working at the international level. So this is ensuring broader political will at the international level to tackle this. And in recent years, BirdLife has been incredibly successful at putting this topic on the agenda of the international community. Um, we have an intergovernmental task force uh, set up um, and governments have signed up uh, to a commitment to cut levels of illegal hunting by 50% in the next decade. And this is a really, really powerful commitment from governments. And our role as NGOs is to ensure that governments follow through on their promise. So they, we will work with them to ensure that this 50% reduction is achieved in the decade to come and that this reduction uh, continues. So we're working towards an end of illegal hunting in, in the Mediterranean. 
And uh, so a couple of uh, final slides uh, to say that um, although this is a complicated issue, our work at all levels is making a difference. So we can see it at the site level. Um, our, our partners on the ground are working with enforcement um, agents to patrol areas that are important for migratory birds. And we see reductions in the level of poaching. Um, a 94% in Cyprus, we have 100% reductions in, in Croatia, um, in places in Italy. Um, and we see on a species level, this is really having an impact. So one of the great success stories from, from Italy in recent years is in the Messina Strait, where um, European honey buzzards were being shot by recreational hunters. And thanks to the efforts of our Italian partners who hold uh, anti-poaching camps each year to protect the species as they uh, travel through this important bottleneck. Um, and we estimate that 85,000 European honey buzzards have been saved um, since this work began. Um, and as I've mentioned, uh, the international commitment by governments is, is taking effect. So we see that uh, national governments are implementing national action plans. Um, they're stating their firm commitment to the reduction of illegal killing. And, and this is, it's, it's, it's coming together. It's, uh, it's not an easy challenge, um, but we see that the, that the conservation interventions are working. So second to final slide, um, as I've said, it's, it's, not, it's not an easy conservation <clears throat> uh, challenge to, to tackle. It's not something that, that can be done overnight. Um, as the, the passenger pigeon and the great auk um, showed us that um, just having legislation in place is not, is not enough by itself. Um, uh, we need to change the attitudes of people. This is a, a generational undertaking. Um, it, it, it won't happen just in one day. Uh, people need to, to be informed um, and they need to be aware of the impact of their actions. Political will needs to support this um, and alternative incomes and livelihoods need to be um, developed in order for people to, to move away from illegal hunting. Um, and also in the case of the passenger pigeon, uh, I want to just underline that illegal hunting is a conservation concern, regardless of whether it's a threatened species or an abundant one. As we saw with a passenger pigeon, uh, once hugely abundant and illegal hunting um, brought it to extinction. So in BirdLife, we uh, advocate the principle of zero tolerance. Um, illegal hunting is illegal regardless of the species. So final slide is just to say that, um, that we would like to thank all of the donors that, that we work with. Uh, we have some amazing support from, from donors around the world. Um, and we also, we rely on, on the public to, to take this message, um, to, to share it, to uh, speak to the local politicians, local enforcement agents, and to support us in, in any way that they can. Um, we're running a, um, a, a fundraising campaign at the moment and uh, we'll share the details of that with the participants of this meeting uh, after the meeting takes place. And we really welcome any support that you can uh, give to the fantastic work that, um, that we're doing and that our partners are doing all around the Mediterranean. Um, and that's it from me, so thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica, for this uh, presentation. And thank you also for the audience started to post their questions that we will take after the um, uh, end of the three presentations. Uh, can I also now give the floor to our uh, uh, participant, Mohammed Abdel Raouf, who is a consultant in the Nature Conservation Egypt and CE BirdLife partner. The floor is all yours, Mohammed. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Raouf, as Osama said. Thank you very much for having me today. Um, I'll be uh, speaking about illegal hunting methods uh, and techniques uh, in Egypt. Uh, just give me a minute to share my screen. Uh, I hope you can see uh, my presentation now. 
Um, so hunting birds in Egypt is a very ancient uh, traditional practice. It has been uh, recorded uh, in pharaonic temples. Uh, and we can we have been able to detect that Egyptians have been doing this. It has been always labeled as um, a royal practice, uh, a practice that's uh, very honored. And the relationship between the Egyptian uh, human and birds and nature in general uh, was uh, something that's very uh, respected uh, all over the ages. Uh, but recently, as uh, was mentioned in the IQB report, and, and as Jessica mentioned, it, we were able to record practices of uh, massive hunting. And uh, this uh, led um, that more attention is given to this practice. Uh, and we needed to, uh, to work on this. So uh, several plans, including uh, a plan and a meeting uh, that was called by uh, the CMS, Convention on Migratory Species, uh, to develop a plan of action to deal with uh, the issue of illegal hunting uh, and trapping in Egypt uh, and along the Mediterranean coast of Egypt and Libya. This plan of action had several, uh, four objectives, but its main goal was to make the uh, bird trapping activities legal and sustainable. Uh, the main the main objective and the first objective was, was actually to understand the scale and uh, um, and the type of birds that are hunted that, uh, where they are hunted and how they are hunted we were not at that time in 2015 uh, really aware of everything uh, uh, happening so uh, through this uh, responsible hunting program that NCE uh, developed with Along with the uh, uh, WWA, which is Egyptian Environmental uh, Authority, uh, we were able to uh, do several activities that give us a more understanding and a better understanding of the situation in Egypt. At the beginning, we started with a socioeconomic survey, uh, which gave us uh, an understanding of who is hunting and and. Uh, uh, and which practices they are uh, doing. We did a legal review, and then we did uh, the best, uh, the first monitoring, uh, actual monitoring uh, of hunting practices uh, in the field to understand the scale uh, of hunting happening. And also we did uh, some communication and outreach activities. The first thing I will be presenting today uh, is answering the question of who is hunting birds in Egypt. And this was, we were able to understand better through our socioeconomic study that we did in 2015. So in Egypt, we have three types. We were able to identify three types of hunters. The first of them is the subsistence hunter, who's, who's hunting for to get uh, protein, to get his food uh, out of birds. And this kind of hunter is the hunter that has been here uh, for a very long time. But with the development of technology and also the development of population, the, the ways, the methods of hunting that I'll be exploring, exploring later uh, uh, developed as well, then there became an, a possibility of turning a subsistent hunter into a commercial hunter. They still, we still have commercial hunters who are doing this to get their funds to you know, to increase their income uh, um, in a reasonable way, but also this trade and and uh, and commercial hunting started to be happening on a very huge scale, and we have records of uh, hunters who uh, and traders who are even exporting uh, all kinds of birds from Egypt um, on a massive scale. <clears throat> the third type of hunter uh, is the recreational hunter who's actually doesn't need money or food and who's doing this uh, as a hobby. It, it, we find that actually that um, in different occasions um, that the recreation hunter is actually spending money uh, to be able to, uh, to hunt, to develop uh, his techniques and so on. So knowing who's hunting will then help us also understand how hunting is happening or um, how each of these kinds of, of hunters are uh, using different methods and different techniques to hunt birds. But 
basically, the, like the main outcome that we had to get out from our socioeconomic study was that we need to acknowledge the cultural roots of bird hunting in Egypt and its importance to the individuals involved in this activity. We had to suggest a culturally sensitive participatory approach that should be adopted to do um, change for this issue. The second uh, part of our uh, program, which was uh, a monitoring program uh, um, through field research, and it happened through the years 2015 till 2018. And it had this study, uh, and you can find the, the report here on the on NTE's website. I will not be going through everything in the report. I will just go on the first objective uh, that we had to work on, that we, uh, which is describing the different hunting and trapping techniques and the extent of their um, spread. Also, you can see in uh, while we were designing this study that we were basically uh, uh, more focused on the coastal tremor nets that I have uh, showed in the first, uh, first slide, which we, everyone was aware of how much they are spread. But when we, and, and when we started this study, we thought that this is uh, the biggest uh, method that people are using to hunt birds. But I will, I will be sharing with you uh, the outcomes we, we reached which was um, quite different from what we thought at the beginning. So um, to be examining the, uh, the northern coast of Egypt, uh, we're speaking about uh, uh, 1,000 kilometers. So we had to divide um, Egyptians' uh, Mediterranean coast to blocks, and we did our study on this. I will not go also very deeply in the methodology of this study, but just tell you that we had to look at, at this uh, distribution of blocks and also we did a distribution of the, the types of hunters and the methods of, uh, of hunting and the different species in each uh, block. Uh, also, uh, it's, it, it has to be noted that block six, which is happening in North Sinai, was, uh, wasn't accessible uh, um, in most times of the study for security reasons. So the first uh, hunting method that we recorded and we were able to, uh, uh, to monitor was the coastal tremel nets. And actually coastal tremel nets are permitted uh, and they are regulated by uh, a ministerial decree that's uh, released by the Ministry of Environment. It's updated every year uh, and it gives uh, the the specs and all the, um, the kind of species that are allowed to be hunted by the different uh, methods. So some methods are actually permitted and some of them are not permitted. And I will be exploring um, all the different methods of hunting uh, birds in Egypt. And I will be stating which ones are permitted and what are their specs and um, which ones are not uh, and so on. So the first type, uh, first type of, of uh, first method is the coastal tremor nets, uh, and they are nets found uh, between 500 meter and 1,000 meter of the coastline. They are mainly uh, designed to be hunting quails in autumn, and they can uh, reach heights up to three meters. They are consisted of two layers of nets. Uh, and when the birds cross the Mediterranean and they go uh, just to land in Egypt, they are the first thing uh, they meet the birds that they are met with, this, with these nets. And, and then they become trapped in a pocket formed by the entanglement of the both layers of the net. According to the regulations and according to the degree, uh, travel nets should be placed 500 meters, at least 500 meters from the shore, and each 1,000 meters of, net, of nets should have 250 meters of gaps to allow for the passage of birds. There are exceptions for this rule that then in, uh, uh, in the areas that are urbanized and uh, that pe people can put the nets uh, closer than 500 meters. And also in the following years, the 500 meters became uh, uh, 300 meters. Uh, it was changed by the 
it keeps changing every year based on the uh, ministerial decree. But these are legal and they uh, are basically uh, used to hunt uh, quails. Through our study, we, we were able to, to realize that 490 kilometers of the 800 kilometers that we surveyed in the coastline were covered by uh, coastal terminals, which is 61% uh, of the survey point. Uh, so we, we can say that at least 61% of Egypt's coastline in autumn are covered by coastal terminals. This is how it looks. This is how um, uh, the quails are getting trapped in, uh, in the nets. And um, it's an old practice, but it's getting more and more spread uh, every year in Egypt. Second uh, hunting method that's used in Egypt, uh, uh, and it's actually it's also permitted one. It's a traditional hunting method. It's called turaha. Uh, and it's uh, basically a, a small fishing net that is thrown by hunters or travel at shops and small trees to catch birds. They are permitted due to their traditional nature and small scale of trapping and can feed and can be found all, all along the coast. Um, they are traditional and I personally, through my field physics, I never saw them really happening. They're getting now declining uh, uh, um, in comparison to the other uh, hunting methods. One more uh, traditional uh, uh, method is um, this one is called daesh, which means a nest, uh, and it's one of the oldest trapping techniques. It's basically uh, happened when uh, through reeds that the uh, hunters uh, develop, and it was traditionally and historically uh, used to target corn creek, but uh, and also due to their traditional nature and small scale of trapping, they are um, permitted uh, to be used uh, for hunting birds. Uh, the third hunting method that's permitted is actually shotgun, uh, and um, and they are uh, usually uh, we are using this model of uh, twelve to twenty millimeter bores, um, and they are usually actually used with decoys and bird calling devices as um, um, supporting. Uh, uh, methods and techniques uh, to be used with these methods. I will be getting uh, more to them uh, in the following uh, uh, slides. But shotguns and rifles, uh, to use them, actually you need two sets of licenses. The first license is to actually have uh, to bear arms. And the second license is specifically for hunting. And by time since 2011, uh, getting these licenses uh, became more difficult by time. Now I'll get into um, the illegal hunting methods, and the ones that's not permitted, uh, and I'll be exploring them. This is these were the new methods that we were able to uh, document or like to to see uh, along the coast. Not necessarily new, but this was the first time that we go down and see them uh, that close at. Uh, um, through this study. So the first one of them is actually the inland tramel nets, which are also tramel nets, very similar to the coastal tramel nets. But these ones are actually placed one uh, more inward in the coastline. So one to five kilometers from the coastline. And um, they're usually much shorter and in a small scale. And um, they are usually almost all the time are uh, accompanied by bird calling devices, which is a supportive um, uh, tool that's uh, widely used uh, in these areas. They are not permitted, and the use of the bird calling devices in the minister decree is explicitly prohibited uh, and illegal. Usually, cost inland tramel nets are not used alone. They are usually accompanied by lime sticks. The one we can see here where birds stick. So hunters usually um, 
stay in areas where they have inland tremor nets accompanied by lion sticks and the sound calling device. And as you um, may know that the um, lime sticks are one of the oldest uh, trapping techniques as well. Uh, they are made of, uh, of the sticks. Uh, these sticks where have they uh, a sticky glue uh, where birds uh, stick to them. Lime sticks and lantramen nets, these methods are more on the eastern area of uh, Egyptian coast. Uh, and they are usually used by subsistence hunters and uh, trade hunters. Uh, while, for example, shotguns are more used uh, on the western side of the country, uh, where um, uh, hunters are able to afford uh, this method. One more method that's more uh, very uh, widely spread on the western side is the halik, which is, uh, as you can see, is consisting of a big net that's covering a big tree, where birds uh, go um, and to one uh, side and they are not able to uh, leave from the other side. Rocks are used to pin down the nets to the ground um, and um, they cover the whole tree where birds cannot uh, leave. Uh, the species targeted there include turtle dove, golden orioles, chef chef, willow warbler, and um, the, the shrikes. They are not permitted by uh, the hunting regulations in Egypt, uh, um, and they are very widely used on uh, the western side of Egypt, uh, of our coast, because they are also very uh, costly uh, to get these big nets to cover um, the trees. One more uh, illegal um, tool is dab nets, which are uh, an advanced version of Daesh nets, the, the, the nest ones. Uh, it's made also of uh, branches or reeds, but they are bigger in size and they have a bigger nest uh, around them where birds get trapped. It's similar to uh, Daesh and also to the Halik, but on a smaller uh, scale. Um, very big uh, also tool that's uh, widely used is the Shirok uh, or the nose that's used to um, hunt falcons. It's a contraption that consists of interwoven uh, nylon strings and applied to another bird's back. So it's uh, they use prey uh, either uh, doves or even sometimes uh, lanner falcons and kestrels. They are, and they are used to hunt to catch larger falcons. And this practice is uh, widely fueled by seasonal demand from the Gulf for hunting birds of prey. Uh, where they uh, get uh, exported uh, for um, to be used uh, uh, in falconry, which is uh, very common in, uh, in in the Gulf area. We can see here uh, how the shirak uh, are available in the um, in the workshops that design them and sell them for the different uh, for the hunters to use them. So uh, usually, actually, what you can see is that uh, the hunter, where we can go to in the field, we see them, they usually are using different tools and different techniques at the same place. So they are using the bird calling devices, plus the inland trammel nets, uh, the shirak, uh, and the lime sticks. And here I will be starting to speak about the supporting tools first one and the most important one which is making a huge difference in the um, how the hunting is happening in Egypt is the sound calling devices which are completely illegal they imitate the sound of birds and attract them uh, they are used all over all along the egyptian coast to maximize the effectiveness of illegal trapping usually with lime sticks and inland trammel nets this is how they look you can see the, um, the, the combination of them uh, it's also worth noting that the bird calling devices are not used on the coastal tremble nets because uh, the, the interference with the waves uh, of the sea, which uh, completely um, not, it doesn't make them useful for it in any way. Uh, and we can see here in, in 2018, we were able to, to do this um, micro uh, experiment on the impact of uh, calling devices. And you can see um, 
here the, the difference between the bird catch per kilometer with calling devices and without calling devices. So we can see uh, in these sites how um, it, it increased uh, drastically uh, while using the calling device. So many of the of the tools like the inland tram nets and lime sticks uh, uh, without the sound calling devices, they are not really uh, very uh, functional and they are, don't hunt uh, birds uh, that uh, effectively. So, but with the addition of a sound calling devices, which is getting very widely spread, which is very easy, just an MP3 player and the speaker, then you can have the, uh, the sounds. It's, in, it's increasing, its impact is increasing uh, in high manner. So technology and the increase of people doing this uh, practices of hunting are actually increasing the bird catch uh, drastically over the years. One more supporting tool is bird decoys. So um, actually, this is what I was saying in the in the western side, in Egypt, where people are uh, hunting for leisure mainly. They are actually spending money on uh, uh, on their hunting practices, or so they're creating bird decoys. Um, like this bird or, or even these uh, plastic bags that attract that, that look like birds in the sky and they attract birds uh, and deceive them uh, you can see here like everything in this scene is artificial the, the hunter uh, stays in this uh, shop and then uh, all these are bird decoys and even the lake he uh, somehow uh, digged it to to make it uh, have, have the small water and to uh, to have the small birds, so uh, this is what I was saying that leisure hunters are actually spending money and investing in these practices for their uh, pleasure. Uh, so bird decoys even look uh, nice on, from um, uh, uh, these views, but they are just deceiving birds uh, for their uh, fate. Uh, thank you very much. And um, I have another video that uh, shows uh, um, how, what are the efforts of NCE working on this, it, uh, this issue, complicated issue. Uh, I may screen it maybe after uh, that we finish all the presentations, uh, if, and if we have time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Raouf, for this uh, interesting and comprehensive analysis of methods and uh, and ways of the presentation have been very specific and direct to the point. With the great pleasure, I would, if you'd like to uh, stop sharing your screen, please, I would give the um, floor to the Society of the Protection of Nature in Lebanon. And with the three speakers, Basim Al Khatib, the assistant director, will start, and then we'll move to Lena Farran, who is leading on the EKB effort, and then to our colleague, Adrian uh, Al Khatib, in the anti poaching unit at SPNL. So, uh, Basima, with pleasure, the floor is all yours. Basima, would you unmute yourself, please? Thank you very much, Osama. Uh, please bear with me in order to, to share my uh, screen. Let me also thank all the participants for the questions and remind them to keep posting it and we will take it after the three speakers. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Basim Al Khatib, and I represent SPNL, Society for the Protection of Nature in uh, uh, Lebanon. And uh, our presentation will tackle the illegal uh, hunting methods, tools, and techniques in uh, Lebanon. The presentation will be uh, uh, presented by three people. Uh, I'll start uh, uh, giving uh, an overview about the uh, uh, hunting situation in uh, Lebanon. Then my colleague Lena will concentrate on the legal methods uh, used by uh, uh, the Lebanese shooters and my colleague Adonis Al Khatib will uh, uh, provide an overview how uh, is the relation between uh, the shooters and hunters and how do we deal uh, with them in order to mitigate the illegal uh, killing in uh, Lebanon. Uh, first I'll start by uh, an overview of the hunting 
problem. Uh, actually, uh, in Lebanon, it's a social uh, uh, hobby, uh, which is embedded in our culture. And usually, it's transferred uh, uh, through generations from father to son. And specifically, it's known to be uh, like a model from uh, politicians in uh, uh, in the country and a role model for the rest of uh, uh, the shooters in, uh, in the country. Uh, the issue uh, has evolved along the years, uh, specifically when and we had the hunting ban in 1995. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, uh, there has been a new generation of youth uh, uh, has evolved, which uh, uh, doesn't uh, uh, respect the nature nor uh, uh, the birds in, uh, in the country. They usually shoot on everything that flies, regardless of species, season, time, and uh, uh, tools. And they even uh, shoot on migratory soaring birds that uh, uh, they, uh, they do not eat. Uh, specifically, I want to, to highlight the, the location of uh, uh, Lebanon along the flyway. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it lies on the second most important uh, flyway uh, uh, in the world, and it's very important for migratory soaring birds in specific. It's considered by ornithologists as uh, a, a main bottleneck as the whole country. Uh, we have more than 400 uh, recorded bird species. Out of them, 291 are regularly occurring where all of these birds are addressed by uh, uh, shooters by uh, illegal killing. Uh, further, uh, I will go back to the study that Jessica uh, has mentioned, which has been done by uh, uh, BirdLife International along the whole uh, uh, Mediterranean in 2015, where uh, uh, it has been identified that more than 2.6 million uh, uh, birds are illegally killed uh, over Lebanon on annual basis. Uh, uh, if we want to uh, concentrate uh, uh, on uh, sustainable hunting, I want to highlight that one of the main pillars of SPNL establishment was to, uh, 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 to contribute to hunting management uh, in Basina, uh, can Lebanon. you just hold your horses, please? Thank you. <laughs> Sorry? Can you just hold your horses? Um, speak. It's, it, it, okay. Yeah, it's, uh... Uh, regarding the Convention of Biological uh, uh, Diversity, they have uh, uh, highlighted the definition of sustainable hunting in its Article 2, uh, where uh, they said it's the use of wild game species and their habitat in a way and at a rate that does not lead to the long-term decline of biodiversity and also to meet the, the needs and aspirations of the present and future generations, in addition to maintaining the hunting uh, 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 hobby uh, as an accepted social, economic, and cultural activity. Uh, along the years, uh, SPNL has contributed a lot uh, uh, regarding hunting and developing a lot of uh, awareness uh, uh, material and scientific uh, uh, material. But the most important uh, milestone was the development of the hunter uh, manual, which, which was adopted by the government for the exams that the hunter uh, need to do in order to get the hunting license. License. Uh, further, uh, in the last few years, we had an important milestone uh, regarding hunting management. Uh, specifically, in March 2017, uh, the president of, uh, uh, of the country uh, has declared a peace treaty between man and nature, between man and birds, urging uh, 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 Lebanese uh, in order to protect birds and specifically migratory soaring birds. Uh, followed by that, in April 2017, the Minister of Environment has opened the, uh, the hunting season for the first time in uh, 22 years since the hunting ban in 1995. 
In May 2017, the president has uh, uh, established the National Committee uh, to be uh, uh, coordinated by Ms. Claudine Onrufus, who, who is the special advisor of the president. And uh, this committee includes all the stakeholders that are involved in the hunting management aiming to uh, promote uh, uh, smooth coordination between the different organizations in the country. Further, uh, this uh, committee has uh, uh, another aim to develop a roadmap and a five-year action plan against illegal killing of birds, uh, where SP and L volunteer to develop these two documents. Based on that, uh, in May 2017, uh, we have done a national conference in West Bikar Country Club involving all the stakeholders involved in uh, uh, hunting uh, management, where we developed this roadmap and a five-year action plan. During the, uh, the remaining of the year, we successfully got uh, uh, the endorsement by the Ministry of Environment, the Ministry of Tourism, and also by the Presidential Palace. Uh, further, we, uh, we have contributed in addition to awareness and uh, education, we contributed to the development of uh, the new hunting law, which is uh, number 580, uh, uh, which was issued in 2004. Uh, and we contributed also to the development of its application decrees because the law in Lebanon is usually a, 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 a general a framework that needs its application decrees in order to be implemented. Uh, later on, it needed until 2011 uh, in order to establish the Hunting Hire Council that includes all the uh, uh, organizations that are involved in hunting uh, uh, management. And also, it's important to highlight that this uh, hunting law uh, mandated for the hunter to carry a hunting permit, a gun permit, and a medical insurance as a mandatory documents uh, to be carried with him uh, in the field in order to be uh, a legal uh, hunter. So uh, uh, the law enforcement had started in 2017 with the declaration of up, uh, opening the hunting season. But unfortunately, uh, the Ministry of Interior and the Ministry of Defense said that uh, uh, it's not a priority for them to follow up on the uh, enforcement of the hunting law uh, because of other uh, uh, issues uh, in their hands, such as uh, the security uh, uh, in the country. So SPNL has suggested uh, uh, two uh, issues in order to support in uh, hunting management. One of them is to promote responsible hunting areas in the country country where uh, hunting could be restricted to these areas under the management of municipalities and using all uh, the regulations in the hunting law and its application decrees while uh, uh, banning hunting in the rest of the country. The other uh, approach is the collaboration and partnership with the Committee Against Bird uh, Slaughter, the CAPS, uh, uh, through missions in the country in order to identify violations uh, of the law and to follow up on these violations with the Ministry of Justice. Regarding the uh, responsible hunting areas, uh, during uh, uh, the migratory soaring bird in stage one, uh, we have worked with UNDP and uh, the Ministry of Environment uh, to identify 12 objective criteria in order to identify these uh, 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 sites in the country. And based on that, we uh, identified eight uh, uh, areas in uh, uh, different regions regions in the country that has been adopted by the municipalities of these areas. 
in stage two of the migratory soaring bird, we have developed an online interactive map uh, that will be uh, uh, uploaded on SPNL uh, uh, website, and it identifies uh, all potential uh, uh, areas for responsible hunting area on all land tenure uh, of the country. As you see in the uh, in the map, they are uh, uh, highlighted in orange. And as the orange gets darker, it means that there is potential to have more uh, of the game species in the area that is uh, highlighted. Uh, I would encourage you to. Uh, to look at this uh, uh, map at SPNL uh, uh, website because it's really very interesting and it helps a lot in identifying responsible hunting areas within the country. Uh, regarding the partnership with uh, uh, with CAPS, this has started also in 2017, where we had in September the first uh, uh, mission of CAPS in uh, uh, in the country, aiming to uh, identify and document. Uh, uh, illegal killing violations and to uh, follow up on this with the Ministry of Justice. And since that time, we are having uh, missions twice uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to Lebanon annually in autumn and spring migrations. Uh, based on that, we uh, we have uh, uh, established in uh, uh, in uh, at SPNL between us and the uh, Middle East uh, Center for uh, Sustainable Hunting. We have established the anti poaching unit uh, uh, in April 2018 in order to uh, work on uh, uh, in the country in order to identify violations and to process prosecute the violators in collaboration with the internal security forces. Uh, as an example of uh, this work, in one month, in April 2020, uh, we have been successful to uh, identify and confiscate more than 800 meters of mist nets in the same region uh, 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 within uh, Lebanon. Uh, further, another uh, uh, issue uh, uh, that has been uh, noted in the last year, we had been receiving a lot of calls uh, related to uh, uh, finding injured MSB uh, uh, birds. Uh, and based on, uh, on that, SPNL has uh, 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 been proactive in its action uh, and receiving these birds and changing the, the bird aviary in uh, Mount Lebanon Hema Center that's located in Kaifun uh, in order to uh, be able to care for these birds and to rehabilitate them uh, in collaboration with vets and providing medications and food. And as you see in these uh, uh, pictures, these are uh, uh, cases of different uh, uh, MSB birds that has been uh, 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 cared for during the last year. Uh, further, I'd like to highlight that we had uh, a lot of support uh, uh, on national uh, level. Uh, the main one was from the presidential uh, palace, as we said, from the peace treaty, and also for uh, in another event in 2019, in May 2019, as a celebration for the World Migratory Bird Day, uh, we had a, a very big event at the presidential uh, palace for uh, uh, the issuing of a new th uh, three bird stamps uh, to be used on national level, where more than 100 people had attended the event and been covered by uh, 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 media on uh, national and international national level. Uh, in addition to the support from the presidential palace, we had support from the uh, Ministry of Interior and uh, municipalities, which urged the internal security forces to support the anti-poaching uh, unit in order to facilitate the implementation of the hunting law. 
Further, the Ministry of Education has also issued a letter uh, asking schools to allocate a one hour during the month of April 2019 uh, to talk about the birds and their importance to their students uh, in order to uh, uh, promote a positive uh, attitude and behavior uh, with the children. Further, uh, the government has uh, uh, fined finally issued the law for protected area management in the country, which includes four categories. Uh, one of them is the HEMA community-based approach, which is promoted by uh, SPNL since 2004 for uh, the protection uh, of specially uh, uh, ecological uh, important areas. Uh, I don't want to uh, to close before having some uh, uh, positive note and success stories uh, uh, in the last few years. We have done an analysis uh, uh, on national level uh, in order to uh, compare uh, uh, different parameters since 2018 up till 2020. And we have noted that all the parameters has been decreasing along the years, specifically uh, the richness in birds uh, uh, that uh, has been killed per uh, plot, and also the individual number of birds per plot, the, uh, the number of species uh, uh, carried by uh, uh, hunters, and the number of individual birds carried by hunters, all of these parameters has been decreasing from 2018 to 2020. And further, during the COVID-19 and uh, uh, the uh, financial crisis in, uh, in the country maybe has been a blessing for uh, uh, the birds in uh, uh, over Lebanon because uh, this has led to the decrease of uh, illegal killing in, uh, in the country because of the increase in the cost of ammunition. So uh, uh, this is the results of the uh, study that has been done by Dr. Ghassan Ramadan Jiradi, who is our SPNL ornithologist. Uh, further, uh, I'd like to highlight that our uh, l l special needs uh, in the current uh, uh, time for related to illegal uh, uh, killing of birds. Uh, first, we need a lot of support for the anti-poaching unit uh, uh, work through uh, providing tools, equipment, and running costs for the unit because we are uh, not only working during uh, uh, the missions of uh, uh, CAPS, but we are also uh, responding to uh, all the calls during uh, uh, the whole year and the whole seasons, uh, which needs a lot of effort and time and uh, running cost. Uh, another uh, uh, issue that needs support is to establish model RHAs per each muhafaza in order to support the hunting management in the country. Uh, further, we need also support uh, uh, the work on uh, the injured MSBs, uh, bird rescue that we talked about, and we, uh, we have already started since last year. These are the, the most important issues uh, that we are working on, and we need support uh, 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 and, uh, from donors in the current time. Now I would uh, leave the uh, speech to my colleague, uh, Elena, to talk about illegal hunting tools in the country. And thank you. Hi, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. I'm Lena Farjan. I'm a member of uh, SPNL, and I'm the IKB manager. I will guide you through the illegal methods that are used in Lebanon. First, the most common one is the mist nets. Uh, people use it in, uh, in agricultural fields and mainly in olive orchards. They put these nets to uh, catch songbirds to sell them later on. Uh, the second most common tool we have is the lime sticks. Just like uh, in Egypt, people uh, do them homemade. They prepare them or they can buy them from stores. They either put them in, uh, on trees or they build trees just so the bird think that uh, these trees are uh, real. The birds get uh, caught in them and then they uh, sell them also in pet shops or for food. 
The third uh, device that is uh, widely used is the calling machine. It's also a supporting uh, device that is used for all other illegal methods uh, to attract uh, birds. These are also bought in, uh, in uh, hunting shops. Uh, the last uh, illegal method that we have is the illuminated trees. These trees are put on uh, the rooftops of residential areas and uh, they light these trees at night so the bird uh, attracts, so the bird gets attracted and they use silent rifles so they kill the bird without any sound. Uh, another technique that they have, once they don't have an actual tree, they draw a tree on the wall, they light it at night and the bird uh, hits the wall, dies, and then they, they catch it. Um, all using also silent rifles. Now I will leave the floor for uh, Adonis. Adonis. Okay. Adonis. We can't hear you. Marhaba. Adonis? Yes. Adonis? We can hear you, Adonis. Go ahead. Hello, Osama. Hello. Yes, now we can hear you. I'm uh, yeah. Please go ahead. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, webinar. Yes, can you see my screen now? Thank you again for the efforts and the presentations you are conducting today. I would like to thank my colleagues from Lebanon. I'd like to thank Mr. Osama. I uh, would like to talk about the hunting language, which is really interesting to talk uh, about this uh, hunting language. In Lebanon, we say that we need to give, uh, we need, we need to, to always to, uh, to put things in their place. So it's uh, among our work in the uh, SPNL, uh, we conducted a, an awareness uh, program within uh, the hunters. Uh, this uh, program uh, has been conducting within hunters and specialists to aware people about the hunting practices and uh, methods. We tried to facilitate the relationship with the, the hunters and uh, poachers through the hunting language. So. There is a difference between the poachers and the hunters. So uh, an, a, a legal hunter should be handsome and should be also having uh, special uh, suits and also having permits. Uh, he is an official hunter and he is also respecting nature. So, but the poacher uh, is not. So what we try to do is to conduct a partnership within uh, Said magazine and ASPNL, the hunting magazine, uh, which is conducting a partnership within the uh, hunters and uh, poachers. And uh, so uh, within this uh, program, um, hunters now they have a main role with us. It's not only to have sustainable practices, but also to conduct by themselves, a an awareness program within their colleagues and their uh, with other hunters. So within this program, we uh, provided a communication approach uh, to fight illegal uh, methods of hunting. And actually, uh, all what we are conducting in the field is communicated to the key forces in Lebanon. And it resulted 
a very positive um, very positive impact uh, in the field. So uh, as you can see in the pictures in my presentation, so actually a monthly basis report or a monthly basis article is published in the side magazine talking about the positive results of our work within the security forces and our other partners. So the next picture is when we conducted the, the, the responsible hunter uh, program and we invited uh, our uh, stakeholders to this activity and uh, the security forces have been represented by a huge number of their, uh, of their representatives. Haida La La program is, uh, is the illegal hunting uh, prohibition, prohib prohibiting legal, uh, illegal, uh, 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 illegal uh, hunting in Lebanon. We call it in Arabic Haida La La. That means that these birds you should not uh, hunt. So, so what we, we try to, to, to do, the communication approach that we call directly the security forces, uh, directly the security forces to react against this illegal method. So now actually their efforts are accelerated and they don't need long time to react and to move against these methods and the practices. So the replacement activity So what we conducted, we conducted an official hunting day. So um, hunters, they were wearing their uh, like official hunting clothes. We conducted this, um, this day within the hunters and the hunters families during uh, spring. Uh, we went from the north to the south of Lebanon and we actually conducted a legal hunting day. Uh, so, uh, hunters, they can find some uh, relevant and uh, some uh, lasting um, hunting practices. Uh, and one of these hunters is Asad. Asad, he representing uh, Lebanese uh, hunters and he's conducting awareness program within program and the Mediterranean uh, areas here in the Arab world. Um, so the so. So actually we try to conduct this uh, legal hunting days and activities within the hunters uh, beside uh, the magazine, the side magazine, which is also conducting informative activities. And we can publish actually their uh, legal practices. And like this, we are awareing other hunters and other people who are still practicing illegal methods. So as you can see in the, um, in the pictures, we are distributing uh, these brochures for legal and official uh, hunting practices. And Asad Sarhan, the hunter's representative, he's wearing his official uh, official hunting uh, uh, clothes, as you can see, uh, uniform actually. And uh, we are really conducting this awareness program among the, uh, on the national level. With trying also to conduct another anti-poaching uh, program uh, to support uh, the um, hunters and the relative uh, people in this sector. We are working, uh, um, we're working uh, according to the uh, hunting season. We are learning that, we are learning that we have a main role to help injured uh, soaring birds because during our activities, we can find these birds and we can also uh, rescue them. Uh, we can rescue them and then rehabilitate uh, them and re raise these birds in the nature. So if we cannot protect uh, this, uh, it's not only protecting them from dying or being hunted, but even protecting them from being injured. So this is what I wanted to represent, to give you uh, today and share uh, sharing uh, with you today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, SPNL team, uh, all uh, Basima, Lena, and Adonis for your uh, presentation. And uh, with that, uh, we uh, come to the end of the first section of the event.
which is the presentation section, and we move into tackling the questions posed by uh, the participants. And uh, let me start uh, by them and try to, uh, to address them. Uh, David, and in a separate note, Michelle as well, they, they said that in a Mediterranean context, why do we use the term illegal hunting and not illegal killing? Uh, you will not get far, uh, David thinks, with your approach at national level working with hunters unless you use the correct terminology. So there has been a, a related uh, chat uh, aspect to it and uh, basically also uh, uh, making sure that this is the ICB is the term used by the EC, burn, CMS phase to support what we think that is the common aspects of, of, of both terminologies, or in a way, the, the crime aspect of it and the zero tolerance aspect of it. Jess, would you like to comment in general? And perhaps Raouf then can, term, uh, can uh, give a feedback about the Arabic language aspect of illegal killing, illegal hunting. That was a discussion I know in Arabic and Basima can recall that for a long time. So just uh, from a European perspective first, and then we move to our Arabic speakers, please. Thanks, Osama. Um, yeah, David, I, I agree that it is, language is an important question. Um, and um, that the term illegal killing is used in the international um, agreements, for example. However, illegal killing is a shorthand that, that we use. So the full term being legal killing, trapping, take and trade, uh, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, and it, it comes down to cultural sensitivity. So we understand that in an EU context, um, illegal killing is the preferred term. And, and that's usually the term that we use, but it's not an appropriate term in most other regions in the world. So just having this shorthand of illegal killing, um, it, it's not indicative enough of, of what we mean and is culturally in, insensitive or in, inappropriate. Um, so in this context, speaking in the Eastern part of, of the Mediterranean, um, Egypt and Lebanon, and um, we use the term illegal hunting as a, as a more, appropriate term and actually um, what Osama was just uh, alluding to the conversations around this term in Arabic it's uh, the intent is to to have something that's easily understood uh, and we also use the term poachers but this is a conversation that goes back and forth um, also the, the, um, the previous presentation alluded to it um, so yes in this context we feel that illegal hunting is, is the best and most appropriate term. Thank you, Jess, uh, Raouf, uh, and then Basma, if uh, any comments on that? I don't have much to add uh, than uh, what Jessica said. Yes, it's uh, uh, in Arabic, it's a very sensitive uh, uh, thing to, to mention killing, uh, to use the word killing. Uh, and um, it shifts the mood of the meetings and shifts the mood of, the, of any discussion we're having when we use this uh, expression, especially in Arabic. So, and it, it gets us into a lot of discussion, it gets us away from what we want to discuss. So from a very practical point of view and a very, um, a place that we want to build a coalition not to, uh, to make people stay in the conflict, uh, it's, it's preferred to, to use the, uh, the term hunting in, in English and in Arabic as well. Thank you. Um, Basima, would, how do you see this? Uh Yes, uh, uh, actually it has been uh, uh, explained by uh, uh, Osama and uh, uh, Raouf, but what I want to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to say more, it's more or less it's related to uh, the translation in Arabic. Uh, a translation of hunting is, uh, 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 is killing birds, but if we talk about killing, it's more or less it gives the notation as if we are killing humans. So, uh, uh, in Arabic, it's uh, uh, the translation is a little bit uh, tricky between uh, hunting and uh, killing. This is why we prefer to uh, to use illegal hunting, which is clearly understood by shooters and hunters that we are talking about birds. Okay, uh, and this is why we are still using it and uh, uh, in our region uh, because it's easier when we are translating to Arabic. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, a, a question to uh, Raouf Nirmina from uh, Bosnia, please. Uh, are the inland travel nets uh, illegal completely or just when accompanied by a calling device? And also, is there a specific time on how long can legal travel nets remain set up in the field? Are there specific months, a specific period of time? Um, okay, so uh, they are, uh, the thing in the specs, that in the, the ministerial decree, what's written is that you shouldn't put nets uh, uh, um, before 500 meters. And that's it. So you can put it anywhere behind. So technically, um, it, it can be considered legal, you know, that you put them in, in just anywhere uh, away from, uh, um, from the shore. But uh, definitely the usage of the uh, sound calling devices makes it completely and explicitly illegal. So that's, that's covered in the ministerial decree all the times. Um, the other part of the question the is that, uh, oh yes, um, it's written also that they, uh, the hunter is responsible to remove uh, the nets in, in the uh, time after the season ends. So it's also uh, it's something that uh, uh, that's the responsibility of the hunter to take care of, uh, and it it should be uh, monitored by the um, the forces after uh, the season. Thank you very much for Ahmed and those who asked about the uh, where they can follow this uh, on the migratory soaring bird project on the on the website. There will be the full recording and the details of the event to be followed at a later stage. Another question also to Raouf, that's an anonymous attendee. He said, are the regulations for the permitted hunting methods, such as, such as the gaps for the tramel nets respected in force, enforced? Is there a daily limit of the bird taken? Uh, let me start one by one. So let's, uh, let's go. Uh, are, are the regulations for the permitted hunting methods uh, respected, enforced? Uh, sometimes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> it, it happens. It's yeah. we 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 were uh, working with uh, with the authorities to to enforce uh, the laws uh, on different occasions, but yeah. not all the times for sure. I cannot be saying this. Yeah. In, this this in very all presentations, enforcement is an issue in Lebanon, in in, is an issue, yes. in the yes. countries, in the Mediterranean at large, and there's a related question to just about that I can I can refer to. Uh, is there a, a daily limit of birds uh, in Egypt? Uh, not uh, on the Mediterranean coast, but uh, it, there is another uh, uh, part section of the, of the uh, decree, which is regulating hunting, for example, in Lake, L Lake Nasser. And it has some limits on the number of uh, certain birds, like the Egyptian goose and something like that, but, okay, so but not uh, on a general scale. And uh, is there a central reporting system for the harvest in Egypt? For hunting, no. no. No, this is also one of the things that we want to work uh, on with the hunting management unit with the WWA. And uh, by now, do we have studies on estimate of impacting the non-target uh, species, especially bycatch of protected species? Is, is it significant? I mean, those birds that are not meant to be really hunted, but they are uh, in a way a bycatch, I would uh, assume. Uh, do we know what would be the percentage to the target? We were, cover we, we were covering, yeah, we were covering this in the in our study. We were cover uh, in the report, we were able to see like, what's the bycatch, how specific are the different uh, methods and are they target um, species specific or uh, uh, other species uh, fall there. Also, we are monitoring the markets, so we're able to see this in the markets if there are um, uh, other species. And, and it's all, um, uh, you can find it uh, in, in details in the report. So, okay. I would, uh, so those who are following also reports, whether from SPNL, it is on SPNL website, NCE website, and BirdLife website also. They are all rich resources of material. Um, to Basima, I would say, and that has been also a long discussion before, uh, Adrian is asking, why does SPNL want to maintain hunting? Uh, I do not see how birds uh, benefit from this. In the end, even responsible hunting kills bird, doesn't it? You unmute yourself, Masla, please. 
Yes, uh, thank you, Adrian. Uh, actually, uh, I want to stress again and again that SPNL is not promoting hunting. What we are trying to do is to decrease the extent of hunting that's uh, done in the, in the whole country. Uh, the problem with it is that it is a cultural hobby that is uh, uh, almost uh, uh, every male in, in the country uh, has taken a gun at some time in his life and uh, shot birds. So what we are trying to do at least is to decrease the, the illegal killing and to make it restricted within the hunting law and its application decrease. Uh, uh, you, uh, we cannot uh, stop it completely uh, in the country because it's, it's something embedded in the whole culture. So we are trying to be realistic in the current time until in the future, hopefully by time and with awareness and education for children and youth, we could uh, uh, change the whole situation and hopefully in, uh, in the long run, in the future, we could uh, uh, stop it completely. So we are trying to be realistic in the current time to decrease it as we go. Thank you very much. Uh, I see uh, also uh, uh, um, Adonis would like to, to, make, uh, to chip in for a comment. Adonis, please go ahead. نعم تفضل نعم انا بشوف انه yes uh, from my point of view during the last 20 years in Lebanon we didn't reinforce the law and this created a, a new kind of hunters who are practicing the hunting during the night and they are using nets for bird hunting by also the lights, by using technologies, by also using other techniques, uh, these modern techniques, which really affected and impacted the hunting in Lebanon. Enforcement, the law enforcement is actually conducted a huge number, a new number of um, hunting methods. The law enforcement is not always working. We need to organize hunting. We need really to communicate with hunters, and this would help um, uh, hunters. Would help hunters to organize actually their hunting activities. Um, the 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 for for example, the night hunting can a hunter hunting in night can can hunt more than two hundred birds during the night. So. There is, this, this is a hobby which is existing in Lebanon. The law enforcement doesn't has uh, results, but the uh, hunting activities organization, organizing the hunting activity can be more, uh, more uh, practical. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Adonis. Um, let me also uh, uh, apologize from those um, participants who would like to intervene uh, through a, an intervention. That would be too long really to take, so I apologize. If you have your questions, please post it on the Q&A sections. And we continue also with Adrian, who, who posed a question also to, to Raouf, uh, saying, is it legal to hunt herons in Egypt? He's hoping this is not the case. No, it's not. It's illegal, yeah. Yes, thank you. And uh, also, and that is a, a general aspect of having seen a, her, um, a horrible massacre uh, on, on, on Facebook, really in, in many of the countries in the region, unfortunately, it is the case. But it, those activities that are seen on, on the Facebook, on other social media are all primarily illegal, we would say. We were hoping and we were some, I know the partners have been doing a lot to try and, and um, stop that or reduce that. Uh, I don't know if anybody from Lebanon or Egypt would like to comment on efforts that are done to reduce or shame, name and shame those or, or even penalize those who do it as an illegal activity. Basima, would you like to comment on that please? Uh, yes, actually, uh, I know uh, if uh, anybody looks at the Facebook in, uh, from Lebanon for years uh, uh, now, and specifically since the hunting ban and uh, the, uh, the increase of the new uh, group of youth who are, uh, uh, they, have, they, uh, they have no uh, uh, respect 
respect for nature or birds. Uh, during these years, uh, we, uh, we have seen a, a lot of devastating uh, uh, pictures on Facebook. But uh, as Adonis has uh, uh, said, we have uh, worked a lot with, uh, uh, with the shooters and the hunters in order to uh, uh, have some partnership with these hunter groups and to change their attitude and behavior to professional hunters. And with these uh, 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 collaborations and uh, partnership, we have noted that there is a, a lot of decrease of these uh, uh, pictures on the Facebook, and they are collaborating a lot in uh, changing the, uh, the shooter to fashion and we are collaborating with them together uh, in order to promote a uh, 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 positive attitude and behavior towards birds. So things are changing and we are having uh, uh, a decrease from all these postings on uh, Facebook as compared to previous years. I hope things will continue decreasing as we go in order to finish this issue. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Basma, for that. Uh... Would you like to comment on the issue of social media, uh, please, uh, Mohammed? Yes, sure. Uh, well, also to, to be speaking about uh, um, positive uh, um, impact and positive uh, uh, achievements, uh, you know, over the years we have been following uh, specific uh, social media pages and uh, specifically with traders, uh, we're trading a huge number of birds. And actually this year we were able to um, do some sort of an arrangement with one of the biggest traders that we were thought that he's inaccessible, untouchable, and we were not able to, to speak to him. And but we actually had a meeting with him uh, and he agreed to work on um, making sure that uh, uh, there is um, no uh, illegal species uh, are hunted or like delivered to him or traded uh, through him. Uh, he accepted that we put some posters and uh, do some awareness in uh, his market and his trade and to, to work with all the hunters who are working under him. Uh, for, for me, like working in this for three years, I think this is a great, great achievement to really be able to, to reach this. I know the images look horrific and all we dream is that zero tolerance and so on, but really the, the road is really long and we, we have to take it step by step and to understand how complicated is the situation after the gaps and years of um, not tackling this issue and how it developed to, to reach this phase. So things are, are changing, maybe slowly, but definitely they are changing on so many levels. So. Um, yeah, that's all what I can say about that. Is, that, is, uh, that is always the case, uh, the levels of, of which this is taking place. So we have, and Adrian has made a, a comment on that as well again, but there are the legal level, what is legal and what is illegal is very set and very clear. And there is the target level, which is uh, just came uh, also across on the Mediterranean targets that we have. And the, the, uh, the ultimate target of uh, naming the crime and making sure that the zero tolerances, there are different levels of things. And yes, it, it can be confusing uh, at, at, at some point to make the right reference to it. Uh, Osama, that is our colleague, Osama al Jibali, is making question to Jessica regarding the 2015 uh, study of bird life that recognized 5.7 million coat birds in Egypt and annually. Do you plan to update this study and relate it to the NCE monitoring program results that came up later? And in addition, does the area of the country and number of its citizens, uh, are, are they taken into account as factors when calculating the number of hunted birds per country? Uh, yeah, th thanks for that question. So I might kick half of it over to um, Mohammed about um, updating uh, with, with new results from monitoring. But um, I'll first go to what, what we were looking into with that report. Um, and hopefully after the meeting, we'll be able to share all these resources because we've got some really great studies, both uh, scientific academic papers and then more sort of readable graphics and uh, information documents. Um, so we were looking at one of the metrics that we were measuring was just overall mean estimate of number of birds killed per country. 
so that was what the 5.7 million was. Um, and so that was that was a range. So that's the, the mean of, of the range that, that uh, was revealed. Um, the other things that we looked into was intensity. So this uh, is partially what, what uh, Osama was asking. So the area of the country, so number of birds killed per kilometer squared, we looked into this. And it's true that if we look at Egypt, um, by that metric, it doesn't even rank in the top five. So by intensity, Malta um, per square kilometer um, has the most uh, birds illegally killed. So yes, we did. We tried to look at uh, different metrics and different factors. Um, and all of that information is in our publications. And it does, the picture is different depending on what you're measuring. Um, we chose to go for overall uh, mortality um, as the sort of clearest indicator. Um, but yes, population size and, and uh, country area should be taken into account and is in the studies. Um, regarding doing an update of that paper. So um, we think that it could be useful to, to revise that. We're um, how many years now? We're six years on from that paper and it was really groundbreaking when it happened. Um, it really brought a lot of public attention and a lot of political attention on the issue. Um, um, but we also feel that we, the debate has moved on a little bit from just wanting to understand the numbers, you know, where it's happening and, and how big it's happening on what scale. So we've moved on a little bit from this um, and the political process has moved on and governments have acknowledged that this is taking place. Um, so we're focused more now on quantifying the efforts to reduce these numbers. Um, so in one way, we could do a repeat of the study and update that data, uh, but it might be more interesting actually to look at um, what efforts the governments are putting in and not just at that one figure, uh, 5.7 million, is it going up, is it going down? Um, and just to add that uh, the political process, the intergovernmental process that I mentioned in my presentation, um, the task force on illegal killing in the Mediterranean, so this um, task force is running a monitoring program that, that looks into this. So governments submit their information um, and the Egyptian government could submit the, this uh, new updated monitoring data um, from NCE. And then that would um, be taken into account for the IKB uh, scoreboard exercise to establish whether we are meeting our 50% reduction in illegal killing by uh, 2030. I hope that answers Thanks, Jessica. And related to that, there has been uh, an anonymous, uh, uh, also related question about uh, how do you describe countries' commitment to the MICT process and targets, and how do you see the role of NGOs in, in that? Um, yeah, so I think, so it's, it's quite new. This, uh, this task force has only been around for a couple of years, and it's really gaining momentum. As I said, it's, um, it's, these reports that BirdLife published um, back in 2015, 2017, 2019 really catalyzed um, this process. And I think that governments, actually there's a lot of goodwill from governments. I mean, they have made this commitment to this 50% reduction. That's a governmental commitment. That's not the NGOs saying we want 50% reduction. That's the government saying this is what is needed and we will work towards this. Um, and so part of that process, all governments so including the government of Egypt, the government of Lebanon, and all other Mediterranean countries. Um, they have signed up to a, um, um, a strategic plan, so a sort of program of work that will help them to get to this target. And I think that will be the key role of NGOs in the coming years. So providing support to governments to ensure the rollout of, of those policies and those strategies to reduce um, illegal killing. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, Raouf, would you like to comment on the part of the update of the Egypt figures uh, back from the 2015 report? Any comment on that? Yes, I think uh, I agree with uh, what Jessica was saying. We are beyond this. Like, we are not really, um, we know that, that through our studies that maybe the, the number was an estimate uh, through a desk review of, um, uh, of what were the estimated numbers of birds uh, caught. And we are working, uh, we are definitely following our uh, uh, numbers coming from our monitoring and our uh, work uh, in the field. 
Uh, that's what we are using in NCE. That's what we are referring to all the time. And we are building on this. Um, and uh, also to be realistic, we, we know that we will never be very sure, no matter how big our studies will be uh, of like the numbers of birds hunted in Egypt specifically. Uh, so we need to monitor to be more creative in what we need to monitor. Like, uh, should we monitor the tools, monitor the areas, monitor um, skill in different ways? And we work on reducing this uh, just to reach this hope of having a sustainable, a sustainable practice in Egypt. Um, I see also in the questions people I will be asking about how much we are uh, committed to, to our zero tolerance uh, of hunting and uh, removing all um, hunting practices. Yeah. I think this is um, this is far and we we are living in a context where you have the Aichi targets uh, not um, met uh, at all and and all the work on, on the, uh, all the legal uh, and the, the commitments the governments take uh, over the years, they, they were not met. And we know that uh, we, we have great ambitions, but uh, what's happening uh, in reality is different. And we, um, so uh, I think monitoring the numbers is something that uh, we are getting beyond and we are trying to to do our monitoring on, on, on different aspects. Uh, conservation efforts, for example, could be uh, a good start. Thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, Ayman is uh, asking about uh, whether there are in Egypt and in Lebanon communication strategies uh, being developed to raise awareness against illegal bird hunting. So I think the, I mean, there has been references in the, in the, in the Lebanon presentation, probably not in the, in the Egypt, but uh, if you'd like to quickly comment on that, uh, uh, Basima and Raouf. Uh, Raouf, would you go first, I think, uh, and then Basima? Sure, we we do, uh, like in my presentation, I wasn't referring to any of uh, the efforts, I wasn't uh, understanding this, uh, but definitely we are uh, working, we have a communication strategy and we have done several uh, communication activities. One of them is actually uh, one of the videos um, I'm really very proud of uh, because I think created in this video, there was so much work on us developing a very specific message uh, that's suitable and that really translates how we see uh, this issue. We know that there are so many, all the time we go to the field, we know we, we are bombarded by questions of uh, colonial actions, uh, where the money is coming from, you are coming from a message from Europe, uh, this is not Egypt, this is not how uh, how it's happening in the area, this is not us, this is, and so on. So it was very tricky and it was a very complicated process to, to develop a communication strategy and a communication message that really showed that our care of birds and our care of the issue is coming from uh, a national perspective. I will be sharing the YouTube link to this video and the comments so everyone can see it and can really uh, grasp uh, how how we see this. Uh, Sorry that we don't time. have the time to show the video, but please do share it in the in the link, please. Uh, Basima, over to you. Any comment on your yes. communication work? Yes, thank you, Osama. Uh, actually, yes, we, we also have a communication uh, strategy and we are building on that in uh, all our actions against illegal killing, uh, whether we are talking about uh, uh, dealing with hunters and uh, shooters. And this is why uh, we distinguish between uh, both of them and uh, uh, we uh, provide alternative uh, activities to each of them uh, in order to uh, decrease the illegal killing of, uh, of birds, also how we tackle uh, uh, children and uh, youth in, uh, in order to promote uh, positive actions and uh, uh, for uh, birds and uh, nature. Uh, uh, so uh, all our work is also uh, built on the communication strategy in order to spread the uh, uh, positive messages uh, 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 for uh, nature and uh, uh, birds and in mitigating the illegal killing of birds. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Paul is asking, and I'm aware of the time, I'm trying to, uh, we have only a couple of questions. 
Paul is asking, do the hunters play uh, uh, the game with recovery, with recovery ringing birds and report this information to the scientific? I think this is in general about the uh, citizen science. Are the citizens involved in our efforts now, normal citizens in Egypt and Jordan, in Egypt and uh, Lebanon, sorry? Yes, that's uh, part of the plan. We are building a coalition of uh, different NGOs and different uh, student groups to be tackling um, the issue of IKB. Uh, this is something that we're going uh, to work on extensively in the coming years, especially with the current project we are having till the end of 2021. So uh, to 2022. So we have uh, big targets on this, and hopefully this will work uh, in the upcoming years more prominently. Okay. Basma, any comment? Uh, yes, uh, actually, uh, uh, um, along the years, we have built uh, 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 groups within uh, each muhafaza or each uh, uh, region, groups of uh, uh, professional uh, hunters that are supporting uh, uh, our uh, work. And uh, uh, through uh, these groups, uh, uh, we are receiving uh, calls on uh, a hotline for the anti-poaching unit. And also, uh, this uh, hotline is receiving calls from normal people uh, about violations uh, uh, against the hunting law. So it's building up uh, by time that people, uh, uh, they know that this is uh, uh, illegal and uh, inhumane and uh, unacceptable and they are uh, uh, already uh, calling and uh, uh, asking for our support and uh, follow up with uh, uh, the security forces and the justice so it's building up with the, with the general public yes thank you i mean a lot of thanks from all around i don't want to go into details many people thank you let me take one final or two very quick ones. An, an anonymous attendee, and probably coming from the North Mediterranean, is uh, asking whether uh, there is that sensation at uh, the uh, the other uh, in the south of the non uh, sustainability of the birds, the way uh, things are. I mean, in the north, they have this feeling about that this cannot go on. Uh, this is not sustainable. Do we feel the same in the Southern Mediterranean? Uh, is this the way people comprehend the issue in countries like uh, Egypt and Lebanon in general? Uh, can I speak? Uh, actually, uh, definitely, we feel that this, can, uh, this is not sustainable, not acceptable, inhumane, whatever you want to call it. And this is why it's one of the main pillars for establishment of SPNL more than 30 years ago. So uh, we are definitely uh, interested in uh, uh, working towards hunting management in, uh, in the country in order to decrease uh, this illegal killing of birds and uh, uh, reaching uh, uh, an acceptable level within the hunting law and its application decrease. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that, that, yeah, can I just please. comment on this? Definitely we do. Uh, maybe it's uh, it's not the place for showing emotions about it because we we are working in conservation. This is our work. This is, we are speaking about practical uh, steps and how we are tackling this. We're trying to reflect reality, uh, but our, our feelings and our emotions that sometimes get expressed. Uh, we try to control them all the time, but definitely we want it to stop. We want to stop uh, hunting all the birds, illegal or illegal. I don't want to see even a quail hunted, but um, I know what's reality and uh, and um, and the situation we're dealing with. So if if you don't get this feeling, it's not because we don't feel it. It's just that we are speaking about practical uh, uh, aspects of it. So okay. I hope this is clear. Usama is asking again, should we study the impact, uh, positive or negative, of COVID spread on the level of hunting? I think Lebanon did show the impact of COVID among other factors, and that is perhaps a common aspect for all of us to, to do that. Adrian is speaking in Egypt, these nest uh, traps are legal, but aren't they used to catch uh, corncrakes, which should be strictly protected? Raouf? Okay. Uh yeah, yes, uh, so uh, studying the COVID uh, situation, uh, definitely it's a, it's a great uh, idea and something that we need to, uh, 
to record. I think NCE is, is doing um, a mo and monitoring uh, this autumn and maybe uh, next autumn as well uh, um, to, to assess the impact. So hopefully we will be covering this. Okay. Uh, for Daesh, uh, yes, it's it's used historically to catch corn crakes and they are legal because uh, they are um, um, in the list. traditional and small in, in scale, but maybe the bigger uh, versions of them, which are Daag, is uh, illegal. So um, they are keeping Daesh uh, legal for its uh, traditional practice and the small scale of hunting, but Daag is not legal and definitely the hunting of corn cakes in general is illegal so but it's uh we have only one remaining question let me have that even if we go one minute by time that's i think for basima after 22 years of prohibiting the hunting in lebanon did you see any change in the behavior of hunters or was it uh, just a period of no effect the total ban that was taking place during the 20 20 years i think before the law was established uh actually the hunting ban and was one of the worst periods in, uh, in relation to hunting management. Uh, during that period, uh, there were no uh, nobody following up, no monitoring, no data, uh, 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 and, and no follow up from the uh, security forces, nothing. So it was uh, a complete chaos. Uh, and uh, uh, shooters uh, 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 has uh, escalated in uh, in number. They they didn't even get uh, 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 information from their uh, uh, parents. They used to try trial and error how to do it in the field, and this is why they don't know species. They don't know season uh, timing. Nothing. This is why we had a, a new group of youth who are shooting on everything. So it's really a diverse stating uh, uh, decision, uh, having the hunting ban for that long, uh, uh, it created a complete chaos in the country. So actually, we feel that now we are in a better situation because it's followed up. Uh, there is the anti-poaching unit. There is a, a little bit of follow up from the uh, internal security forces in co our collaboration. Uh, uh, and there is data uh, that is uh, 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 increasing by time, we are having a database uh, uh, for follow up, uh, so it's it's much better than the, the period of the hunting ban. Very good, thank you very much, Basima. And uh, for the comment of, from Akram SSCW, yes, we do appreciate uh, countries under um, civil unrest. Uh, uh, well, NGOs are um, exerting big efforts in difficult difficult circumstances. This is appreciated. Red Life will continue to support uh, all the countries in the region. I think this is a commitment that is well made. Very good. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. I would like to again uh, thank uh, all the uh, three pre great presentations, BirdLife, NCE, and the uh, SPNL, all the speakers. I would like to not to miss uh, thank Atif, our uh, great interpreter for uh, this uh, uh, excellent job. Thank all the participants. Um, it is clear that we need more of those discussions, more interaction on the subject, and hopefully with the uh, great support that we are getting from the MAVA Foundation and from the Migratory Soaring Bird Project. We are uh, continuing to do that. Thank you very much. Uh, you can definitely contribute to the efforts of BirdLife and donate on the, uh, on, on the uh, link that is there now on the screen for those who would like to support the BirdLife ongoing efforts, or directly support the BirdLife partners in that uh, uh, field. And we promise to continue that discussion live and ongoing. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, hopefully till next time. Thank you very much. <laughs>